Well hi folks, welcome to your Classic Car Channel, it's a lovely day and I've been spending a bit of time on Big Dodge as you uh, may have spotted in the recent uploads I took Big Dodge out for a run to a breakfast classic vehicle meeting very recently and uh, it went quite well, it's the first time it had been out in about seven years so I wasn't quite sure what to expect but on the way there it was just starting to splutter a little bit. Um, I was able to sort of put the choke on and that improved things and coming back I ran with just the choke partly out and there was no problem at all. Which tells me that it's running either a bit lean or more likely once it's warming up we're getting a bit of fuel vaporising. Now the carburetor is down there just to get the lie of the land. Let me see if I've got a torch. The carburetor is down there. It's a big old Stromberg and the fuel pump, mechanical pump is down there. This SU pump isn't used. And there is the exhaust manifold. So it's quite a big thing, cast iron, and it gets very, very hot. Now in the past I had to lag the exhaust, front section of the exhaust, there, because it was cooking the batteries which are somewhere over there. And I think what is happening, once you start, you know, do a mile or so down the road, it starts to get a bit hot down here. You've got this huge cast iron manifold, which obviously gets very, very hot indeed. And down below, you've got the exhaust, which I'm not sure I can see that. Is down there. And the combination, I think, is just getting too hot here. And it's affecting either the mechanical fuel pump and or the old carburetor. Now, what I'm thinking of doing is but making up a heat shield to go along here to stop some of the heat from the exhaust manifold going down towards the carb and the fuel pump and also I'm going to shield the uh, exhaust downpipe down there and also add some of that wrapping the insulation if you like to the forward end of the exhaust which isn't there at the moment now let me just go down here actually I should have brought this up actually I've been made a start on making a heat shield and this is it found an old piece of metal down the back of the garage. I will clean this up I promise but this is going to be the heat shield. Free. Need more hands. If I just go back down here. I'm so organized. Right. If we set up this lamp over here like that. This is going to go in here. And that will jiggle into there. You have to watch because at the back there is a copper pipe so I don't want to be touching that but that's roughly the position this will go in and that will do quite a good job of shielding the heat and I found that these exhaust clamps, I found two of these, just go over the inlet manifold so if I drill a couple of holes through here, somewhere around here and another one over there that will locate this particular heat shield and I think that will probably do the job. Now I had thought of going off the carburetor mount, here's one of the spare carburetors. I thought I could have made the adapter, or rather the heat shield. i just get that, without everything falling over. And I'll show you what I mean. Now I could have designed this heat shield in such a way that it sits on there between the carburetor and the manifold and is secured with these two holes here, the bolts that go through there. But any time I wanted to remove the heat shield I would have to take off the carburetor and I don't want to disturb that. So if I hang this from the inlet manifold, which doesn't get anywhere near as hot as the exhaust manifold, so if it goes on there like that, it means I can whiz the heat shield off without disturbing the carburetor. I mean, you can see this was all painted with high temperature paint many years ago. The paint on the inlet manifold is still okay. Obviously the paint burnt off really quickly on the uh, exhaust part of the manifold. And you can see how the paint is there at the bottom, but not further up. So that tells you how hot the top gets as opposed to the bottom bit. So I think having a heat shield there Let's go underneath and we can have a proper look under there and see what's going on. I'll just slide under here with my usual elegance and grace. It's a good thing about lorries is you don't have to jack them up, you can just clamber underneath. So there you go, you can see that the exhaust 
is lagged with this special exhaust wrap for most of its length actually. There's a little bit there that isn't. But yeah, it was cooking the batteries, which is never a great thing. If we go under here, we can see what's going on. So there's the exhaust, obviously. Up there, it's the bottom of the fuel pump, and there, the bottom of the carburetor. So I'm going to make, unfortunately, on the chassis here, I've noticed there are three, can't really see, but along here, there are three convenient holes which aren't used. So I'm going to make a heat shield that comes over here from the chassis and round here. And that will just deflect some of the heat from the exhaust away from the fuel system, which is up there. That's the theory anyway. And we'll just have to see if that works. And it will also, the second benefit of doing this is, if you have, have a drip from the fuel pump or the carburetor, at the moment it's just going to drip straight onto the exhaust, which, all right, it's lagged and isn't as hot as it would have been, but you really don't want fuel dropping onto a hot exhaust. So if I put a shield here, it will just protect from the fuel dripping straight onto here. So it's a sort of a double benefit, if you like, really. So that should be fairly easy to make one of those up. And I'm going to extend the exhaust wrap all the way up the front there. Because there is a little bit at the top, which isn't done yet. So I think the combination of heat shield at the top, heat shield at the bottom, and a bit more of this insulation should help keep the temperatures down a little bit but what I don't want to do is block this in too much because then you haven't got any airflow around the, the fuel pump or the uh, carburetor so you've got to be a bit careful and I did think about running a bit of trunking in possibly so that when you're driving along you get a rush of air straight into this area to offset the heat that's going to you know inevitably going to take place alongside a big engine like this so anyway that's what I'm planning on working at at the moment I'll just get out from here. Yeah. So the next thing I need to do is to drill this. Then I can mount this heat shield onto the inlet part of the manifold, the cooler part of the manifold, and we'll just see how that goes, see if it improves things at all. Um, cause like I say, if you pull the choke on a bit, it ran fine, which makes me think that we're probably getting some fuel vaporisation, which is never great. What else? I've got a feeling that the throttle isn't coming on fully. There is a little stay, a little sort of tab on the throttle pedal, and I've got a feeling that... I'm going to have another look at this other carburetor that's here. When I look at the mechanism and how much movement there is, on the truck itself i think it is only going that's fully closed and then as you accelerate the butterfly which is this being here opens and if i've got the if i've got this right it's only moving about that much it's not getting the full throttle so i need to see if i can fiddle with the throttle pedal and just see if i can get it to open fully because at the moment it's not even half throttle and if i get it fully opening it's going to go quite a lot better I think this is what the oh, it's a huge very heavy carburetor this is a Stromberg SF3 this is one of several spare ones that I bought off eBay America over the years this may even be a new old stock this body I think South Bend Was that? somewhere Bend in USA yeah Stromberg SF3 big heavy clunky thing but it works, so that's all that matters. Anyway, I'm going to go and find my drill. Drill this up, get this fitted, and then have a look, take some measurements, and uh, see what we can do down below. And I've obviously got very rudimentary tools. Any metal worker will cringe when they see what I'm doing, but, well, if I show you my total set of metal working tools, you'll understand why this isn't exactly Pebble Beach quality. There's another carburetor in it, another spare Stromberg, but yes, I've got a ruler. I've got the vise, which I do the initial bends in. Nice pair of these, these Gilbos, I think. Yeah, Gilbo. Just about to see it on there. The Gilbo Tool and Steel Company Limited, Sheffield, England. Those are lovely, they just, it's like a knife through butter using those, those are great. A pair of pliers and a hammer. Got a few hammers, but that was all I used to make 
this apology for a heat shield it's not the best looking thing in the world but i will clean this up a little bit i'll put some returns on here just to get the extra strength around here around here and along here plus you haven't got a sharp edge either so you're not going to lacerate yourself every time you go near the carburetor because that would be bad but i think that'll do quite a decent job of keeping some of the heat away from the fuel system in theory Okay, well that's the upper shield in place now. There's a little bit of wiggle room on the holes that I drilled. So uh, hopefully that'll just stop some of the heat washing down from this huge cast iron manifold in the direction of the fuel system. Now, I just need to do the uh, shield underneath now. Um, it may not have been an issue back in the day, but the fuel that we're running on today is very different to the fuel back then. And even though the quality of the fuel back in World War II in the 1950s wasn't great, the old pool petrol and so on. Um, it just seems to uh, be a bit less picky than modern fuels which don't like getting hot under bonnet temperatures. Vehicles that get fuel vaporising now may not have done back in the 50s and 60s when they were currently in use but for some reason modern fuels um, it can be a bit more prone to vaporising so you have to go to these lengths just to try and keep the temperatures down a bit under the bonnet. Anyway, hopefully this will come in the next couple of days and I can apply that as well. So what have we been up to today? Well, I've been cleaning up some old oil containers here. We've got a Pratt's motor oil container, heavy, and it says something else down here, but I'm not quite sure what that says, but it also says SO on it as well. So I'm guessing if that was just Pratt's, it'd probably be sort of 1930s, but I'm guessing this is probably more 1950s with the fact that it has SO on it as well. It's a nice old thing, so I've just been oily ragging that up a little bit. Same with this here. Now this is an old Redex oils oil container. Extreme pressure, what's that say? Something and carbon replacement. Something anyway. Anyway, it's been cut down and been used for oil changes on a lorry. So I thought that would be ideal for Big Dodge. So someone's actually cut it down from what would have been a fairly large oil container and they've even curved over the edges just so that you don't catch yourself on here which is quite a nice little detail. So that's been cleaned up as well that was you could barely read the writing on there but as you can see if you look at this old red X sign you can see the bottom of the X on there so that's quite nice that's quite a nice old thing probably 1950s so that'll do very nicely there and this was actually designed as an oil drainer a bp super visco static sump drainer maximum safe capacity 10 pints so this is very much car size rather than lorry size but it's just a nice old thing that's been tucked away down the side under some stuff for years so i thought i'll dig that out while i'm on the oil cleanup uh, mission and that can be displayed properly so right that's just a by the by so let's go and have a look down here because i have been doing a bit more work on the mgb it's a breezy old day today all right so i've taken off the water pump that was a little bit of a fight um here's the old one down here it's not a very big thing at all but it's not in the greatest of condition it was making a racket when i had the engine running last and they're only cheap to replace so that's come off but it was a bit of a fight one of the bolts in particular as i mentioned on the old classic car forum recently i had to sort of uh, partially mutilate that to get it off but it came off and i was actually surprised actually just how clean the waterways are in this engine often when you take a water pump off it's the water galleries are full of rusty crudded up clag you know this one isn't too bad at all actually so if you look there and if you look on the engine itself there's just antifreeze in there i don't think i've ever seen water galleries on an iron block engine that clean i mean given that the car's what 45 years old now I think that is incredible to me because I've never seen an engine that clean inside, which is all good. So I just need to put the pump back on, the new pump, which is down here. It's a brand new 
repro thing fairly rough casting pretty rubbish but it'll do the job so that's all ready to go back on and hopefully there won't be any more water pump racking I've got some new hoses here it came with some fancy dancy new hoses I was going to buy some but then I found these so that's all good so they can go on the old ones are around somewhere but anyway it's all nice and easy to get at that's one of the beautiful things about the B is there's loads of space down either side of the engine and loads at the front sometimes you have to pull the radiator off to be able to get the water pump or get out the water pump on this there was no need this is the auxiliary air pump which is part of the emissions gear for the American market I've just loosened that up and swung that out of the way to get at the bolt here for the alternator which is a bit fiddly if you leave that down so you have to swing that up to get at that but yeah it's all ready to go back together so I think I'll probably crack on with that now well that's the new pump back on it all feels tickety boo when you give that a turn it's all bolted up the uh, bolts are actually different compared to the UK market cars because you got the extra bracketry the thickness of the bracketry to take into account for the air pump anyway that's that's back together and if I have a quick look at the old pump over here on the bench I mean this this is probably the original I mean the cars only done 18,000 mile but this has been on the car for probably 45 years and when you try and turn this it's just sticky you know sort of notchety it doesn't sort of spin smoothly it's quite clunky and it's just in a very poor state which is not not really surprising given the age of it and it may well have been run with no coolant in at some point in the past but that feels rough as anything absolutely terrible so replacing that was long overdue that's good anyway i can go in the bin these are actually the new those hoses down there are the old ones these are the new ones here they came with it and they're whizzy kevlar reinforced wow such luxuries so they will go back on that's the bottom hose which goes somewhere down there like that i think we'll have to chop this this one off a little bit this is way too long but anyway they can go on i found a new old stock fan belt for it it's a proper V belt as you can see it's a proper V belt it's not been used before and if I have a look down through the British Leyland we've got MGB 1800 GT 1962 onwards so hopefully that'll fit the air thing the air compressor that has its own separate belt which I won't bother putting it on and it has a twin uh, pulley for the two belts but I won't be putting that on this is the one that was on the car it's just one of these horrible modern things they're not very nice at all so we'll put a proper one on and we know things are right Oops, as he trips over over the hose right so all I need to do now is put the air pump back down put the fan belt on readjust up the belt onto the alternator and then do the hoses all right well i'm getting there now water pumps on pulleys back on another fan belt the one that i dug out which said mgb alternator or dynamo didn't actually fit so i had to have a bit of a route round and found one that fitted the one that was on wherever that's gone yep there's this sort of toothed belt which i don't think looked very in keeping for a 70s car so that can go in the, in the spares pile just in case i ever need it but this one looks a lot more in keeping dated 1983 so that's about the kind of thing that would have been fitted to it on its first full service i guess and where else are we up to yep that's bolt i've actually left this back on because it didn't seem to want to come off when i took this bolt out there seems to be a collar inside which was holding it onto this bracket so i thought it can stay on it's part of its history so that's all good first hose is on the top hose nice jubilee clip Jubilee, focus, Jubilee. Yep, there we go. That's all good. We've got Jubilee clips for the for the bottom hose as well. That's all good. So I just need to pop that on. And then we can put some fresh coolant in, and then we can try it out and see if it uh, runs properly.
new top hoses on that was all nice and easy this one is okay I attached it there but as with all repro stuff it doesn't quite fit because the internal diameter of this hose here is nowhere near big enough to fit that in that where are we? that ain't gonna go in there so I mean if I was an animal I would cut that end bit off there just to narrow the, the overall diameter but I'm not sure if that's really the thing to do so I might just have to see if I can uh, open this up a little bit I don't want to go too berserk but there is quite a lot of material to play with there but it's just you know pattern parts repro parts modern parts they just they're just not great are they like I say these new plug leads they're just uh, they're not sort of cut to length really I bought those spe you know, specific for an MGB but they're way too long fuel filter that's okay um, but I, you know more often than not I find with repro parts okay it's better getting repro parts than no parts at all but you just think do they actually try fitting these things on cars or do they just sort of uh, hit and hope a little bit I do find repro stuff very depressing a lot of the time, I must admit. Nothing seems to fit properly. Let me know in the comments um, what you think about repro parts not fitting and the, your experience of that. Anyway, I'm probably going to have to take the hose off again and just see if I can open this up a bit so that this heater hose will get in there comfortably. Because at the moment, it isn't going to do it. Right, so what I'm going to try doing is I forced in <coughs> the handle of this small wire brush into the... Uh, hose as you can see it's forcing it out and I'm just hoping that if I leave that for a few days it'll just expand this end of the hose a little bit just enough so that I can get that heater metal heater pipe back in there um, it should work but I'll probably just have to leave it for a couple of days and see how we go from there A bit of a tinker with a standard I'm going to have another look at the tappet settings or just in the tappets um, I did it once before but I still think it's a bit noisy at the top it could be like I say a bit of wear on the rocker shaft uh, and the rockers etc but I'm just going to try adjusting it and just see if it comes out again if I can adjust it away um, you'll notice that the angle is down here now because the MGB has gone over to dad's uh, he uh, he's quite keen on uh, getting it back on the road and running so uh, I moved it over there recently, so it's over there and he's tinkering with that, fiddling with the carburetors, checking compressions and all that kind of thing, just to see if we can improve on how well it runs. And that meant that the Anglia could come down here, joining the standard, which is over there. So, like I say, I'm going to have a quick fiddle with that one this evening and just see if we can make it run a little bit better. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, I've got a gearbox here. This is a plea to see if anyone knows what this gearbox is off. It's obviously pre-war, pretty early by the look of it, um, but I have no idea at all what this gearbox is for, what car this is off. Um, it seems a shame for it just to be kicking around here when someone might actually be able to use it. It does turn and it actually feels okay. You can see the... It 
so the input shaft rotates pretty nicely so that feels all good and very little play on that so uh, obviously it's going to want stripping and overhauling but if anyone knows what it's off that would be really useful there's no markings on it that I can see but obviously it's got a fair bit of age to it it'd just be nice to reunite it with uh, well rather reunite it with a car that it suits while we're on the subject of strange things here's a little poser for you what is this? This turned up at a car boot sale a few weeks ago. And to be honest, I didn't actually spot it until the, uh, the, uh, the stall holder said to me what it was and pointed it out to me, because uh, I just hadn't noticed it at all. But do you know what this early car accessory is? You can still buy these new, they're still making them. Uh, but typically these would have been fitted in the 1920s, 1930s, that kind of era. But do you know what this is? Let me know in the comments if you can identify this little oddment of uh, motoring history. Maybe you could also let me know, once you've identified what it is, why someone would actually fit one of these. I'm still not quite sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, more information wanted, please. While I'm going down this rabbit hole of uh, interesting things we found recently, this turned up yesterday. A John Bull Jr. repair outfit. Not quite sure on the age of that one, probably 1930s or something like that. Funny enough, Harley was actually his usual six feet ahead of me walking around the car boot sale. And he didn't bother picking it up, but he did see it. Um, so I didn't make that mistake. It's quite a cool thing. It says on the back, ride John Bull tyres. And in small writing, and you'll have practically no use for this outfit. Suggesting that John Bull tyres and perhaps inner tubes were jolly robust and you probably wouldn't get a puncture and you wouldn't need this kit. What a cracking little thing that is. There are quite a few old puncture repair kits in the garage and again, they're just a nice affordable thing that you can actually collect, put in a cabinet and they just cost a few pounds each, that's all they are, but they couldn't be the basis of a really nice little display I think. And anyway, it'll look good in the garage with all the other junk that's in there. Anyway, I just thought I'd show you that one. Anyways, back to the job in hand, and the job is to have another look at the standards. So first thing I do is where's the bonnet up, dig out the workshop manual. That's only once I've gone and got back in the house and found the keys for the car. The workshop manual is inside, and then I'll report back once I've uh, opened the car up. Okay, well that's the car opened up, so the tappets live under here. This is the rocker cover. Um, it's an overhead valve engine, side valves. The, you'd be doing the same job but down on the side of the engine which is really quite fiddly but on these it's fairly straightforward all we need to do is whiz off these two nuts lift that off and then it exposes all the rocker assembly and the top of the valves and so on which I'll have a quick look at in a minute but first off we need to have a look in the book of words the workshop manual and just see what we should be doing so this is a proper factory workshop manual for the standard eight Probably very similar to that for the standard 10, as it also refers to there. And it says here, this is a number we have to bear in mind, adjust the tappets to 0 0.010 of an inch, or 10, thou, 10 thousandths of an inch inlet and exhaust. Sometimes some engines they have a different setting for the inlet and the exhaust valves, but this is the same for both of them. And sometimes it also says, or it's recommended that you do it when the engine is warm. Um, it doesn't make any mention of that here, so we'll just uh, do it from cold and see how we get on. Now, well, from this little box of tools, I've dug out a set of feeler gauges. Now, this has the clearest markings on it. Sometimes the markings aren't very clear. But basically, you've got all these little gauges here. And these are all different thicknesses. These pieces of metal here are all set to different thicknesses, and you pick the one that you need. So according to the book it's 0 0.010 or 10 thou and there is the corresponding feeler gauge it also gives the metric equivalent whatever that is right let's, let's crack on you don't want to over tighten these I remember on the Spitfire engine that I used to have many years ago which was the same basic engine as this I over tightened this and it's only fairly thin metal what happened was it actually pulled this down a little bit to the point where the rockers which are banging up and down underneath were actually hitting this and it made a right racket 
so golden rule number one don't over tighten the nuts on the rocker cover because it could have disastrous consequences well, that's the rocker cover off uh, my table for this evening is a 1945 war department jerry can bmb i think is the maker of it now what have we got under here then so this is the rocker assembly so here we've got the valve springs there inside there is the valve that goes up and down very rapidly letting exhaust gases out and the fresh fuel mixture going in and these are the rockers themselves and these are the push rods these rods here that operate the rockers which these basically pivot on the rocker shaft and they push down on the valve spring and the valve opening and closing the valves as required and the gap that we're interested in is the gap between the top of the valve which is in there and the heel of the rocker arm i.e. the bottom of the rocker arm there and when this valve is fully closed and this is at its maximum height there is a tiny fractional gap between the top of the valve and the rocker and that is what we have to measure using those feeler gauges which I'll put somewhere I'm not quite sure where yep. put them over here because we don't want to short out the battery by laying metal things across there do we so uh, yeah so that slides in there but you have to ensure that the valve is fully closed before you measure the gap because otherwise you're not going to get it right so there's a thing called a rule of nine now this only applies to engines four cylinder engines with two valves per cylinders other configurations of engine have their own rule but this is the rule of nine now why have the rule of nine well this is what it is so you've got eight rockers one two three four five six seven eight you have to adjust each of them in turn and the rule of nine works like this you start at the front this is number one so to ensure that number one is fully closed you make sure that number eight is fully open i.e that one is fully down so you're checking you're adjusting number one look at number eight add the two up one and eight and it gives you rule of nine when you adjust number two you have to make sure that number two is fully uh, closed so you look at number seven which is that one two add seven is nine the rule of nine so when you adjust that one number two you make sure that number seven is fully down i.e the valve is fully open and that's how it works so what you've got here so to adjust number one i turn the engine now this is the beauty of starting handles i did do a video all about starting handles long term as we'll remember but you can bung the starting handle in through there where are we through there that engages on the front of the engine on the crankshaft you can sometimes just use a big spanner on the crank nut which is down there but it's easier using a handle if you've got the facility you turn the engine over by hand until number eight that rocker is fully pushed down on the valve i.e the valve is fully open once that's at the bottom of its travel then you can adjust the gap here because that means that this one is fully closed Well, this is really tricky to do single-handedly so I don't quite know how much of this I can actually record but you'll get the idea anyway consult the workshop manual for the the full procedure but this is just a bit of an overview of what the basic principle is of setting the tappets on an engine like this so I've got the starting handle in so like I say to adjust number one gap I have to keep an eye on number eight at the back there and wait till that is fully at the bottom of its travel and this gives you an idea so we'll just keep a very close eye on number eight. It's just starting to go down now. That's it. So that's at the bottom of its travel. We're not talking huge movement here. But with that one fully down, I can turn it again. And you can see it's coming back up now. 
So we go keep going and then we'll get the next time round. It's a little bit easier if you take the plugs out because that gets rid of any compression but it's not too bad on a little engine like this. So we'll just wait till that rocker starts going down again. Number eight. There we go, starting to go now. Right, that's as far as it's going. So that means that valve is fully pushed down, i.e. open. So that means we can adjust number one. And the tiny gap there is what we're looking at. You can just hear there's a fractional bit of movement in there, which is what you want. You don't want it fully tight, because what happens then is the valve doesn't fully close, which isn't great. So we can get the uh, trusty, feel uh, trusty feeler gauge in. Like I say, this is a 10, 10 thou, 10 thousandth of an inch. And that's where we go in. We're going to slide it in there. And you want a reasonably, you don't want it loose, but you don't want it too tight either. And that's probably just about right. It just slides in like an interference fit. I mean that doesn't want to be any tighter than that really. What you've got, if that was really slack or really tight, what you have to do, I'll just sort of uh, talk it through as an example. You've got here, this here, oh, all right, there we go, this here is the lock nut so you slacken that off and then the screw i.e. a bit in the middle you tighten it down to close the gap up anti-clockwise to open the gap up a little bit and basically while the lock nut is undone which only takes like half a turn or so it's not a great deal you slacken that off you adjust this until the feeler gauge just slides in there with a nice sort of close fit Put your screwdriver in there, make sure that doesn't move and then you just tighten up the lock nut again and then recheck the gap and you go through doing all of them the same way so when you adjust the last one, number eight, it's number one that you want to see fully down that's basically how you do it so I'm just going to go and crack ahead with that because I can't really do it and film it so I'll report back once I've worked my way through the engine and just checked all the gaps like I said I did do this a week or so back with Harley we had a bit of a uh, tuition session just teaching him about the rule of nine and all this kind of thing um, but I've got a feeling there's probably wear in this rocker shaft so no matter what I do with the gaps it's always going to be a bit noisy at the top I think so I could probably do a finding out another cylinder head assembly with all the rocker gear on it or at the very least a known good rocker assembly that I can put onto this engine but for now I'm just going to recheck all the gaps and just see where we're up to and just make sure that none of them are a bit on the loose side Okay, well that's it. I've been through all eight of the valves and checked the tappet adjustment on them. I nipped up a couple of them, but to be honest there wasn't a huge amount of play. They may have been fractionally over, um, but not very much. So I uh, just need to put the rocker cover back on now. And I'll probably take it for a spin and just see how we go. I'm not overconfident. I still think it's going to be a bit noisy at the top. Um, I did at one point think that the sort of tapping noise we're getting could be possibly from the timing chain and I have actually ordered another timing chain which is only like 12 quid plus postage so I thought well it won't harm to have one in stock anyway but every time I listen to the engine running with a bonnet up it sounds like it's coming from here as opposed to the front of the engine it's a very distinct it, you know all the signs are that it's coming from the top of the engine over here I don't think it's that unusual for these engines to suffer with worn rocker assemblies so uh, it may be that it's just a little bit tired at the top. Anyway, let's put it back together and see how we get on. Well, as you can hear, there's still a bit of a tap from somewhere and I'm 95% sure it's somewhere around here as opposed to down there. Anyway, it's not going to stop me using it, it's just a bit annoying, that's all. But I will look out for either another rocker assembly or possibly just a complete cylinder head. 
Um, it may well be that the cylinder head's the same as that on the smaller engine heralds, like the 11, 948 and the 1147. So I need to do a little bit of research on that one. But otherwise it runs quite nicely and everything else in the drivetrain seems pretty ha happy. Well, the planned uh, little jaunt out in the standard didn't actually happen. I got dragged into a bit of gardening, which is always joyous. So uh, I'll probably leave that till tomorrow and take that for a little spin. And then I'll see what next to do in the search for parts for the standard. Like I say, I think I'll look out for a head and maybe a rocker assembly for it. Neither of which is particularly difficult to fit. You can see the rocker arrangements on there in the, in the workshop manual. It's all pretty straightforward four cylinder overhead valve or pretty basic stuff but I think I'll probably tidy up and that'll do for today so uh, crack on with it again tomorrow all being well like I think I probably said in the previous video the idea this bit of a lean-to thing has been here a long long time it's all falling to pieces it works but it isn't pretty so uh, I'll probably be taking that down before the end of the year and maybe look at replacing that with something a little bit more visually pleasing and it is at the moment. I'm sort of clearing through some of the clutter that's sort of accumulated in here, hence that gearbox which I just dug out, which I'd like to try and find an ID for. So yeah, I'm just sort of gradually clearing out stuff that I don't need to make room for things that I do need or want. Right, let's, let's carry on tidying up. Okay folks, well it's another evening and uh, there is a pub meet taking place um, so I thought Anglia can come out, this hasn't been outside for a little while apart from when I moved it down into the bottom garage so it's, uh, I think it's feeling a bit left out what with all the attention being on the standard recently and taking the two dodges out so uh, yeah, the Anglia is going to be fired up and head off over to this pub meet I'm not sure if I've shown any of this old club that's on the back seat before I always like to decorate it with a few interesting things, we've got to take the family out for a run with a pop on the cover, which is about the closest thing I could find. PC49 annual, a motor manual, workshop manuals, and of course, an old school map and from the days before Sat Nav. Various other little goodies on the back window shelf there, because we don't do modern here, so that's all well and good. Got a few bits and bobs there, which I think. probably seen those before so yeah I thought it'd be nice to take the angle out it hasn't been out for a little while and I believe that last time this uh, meeting took place which I didn't go to I've not been for a little while there was a local gent with his E83W van there so I'm hoping to also see that fingers crossed now I probably won't do a, a video while I'm there because it's only a small meeting um, but I'd like to have a quick chat with the E83W man and talk old Fords for a while. So anyway, I'm going to fire this up, head off and see what else is going to turn up this evening. So wish me luck. Well, OK, here are just a few photos of the evening meet that I went over to. There's a various cars there, classics and vintage cars. Uh, it's organised by the VSCC, the Vintage Sports Car Club, the local area group, but anyone with an old car is invited. And this uh, Triumph TR3A was one of the post-war cars that turned up. And here is a Wolseley Hornet Saloon. This six-cylinder saloon followed me in um, as I was driving down in the Anglia. Uh, this caught me up in my rear view mirror, as most cars tend to do. Um, it's a very original car, this one. You see it at all the shows locally. And here's one of two E-types that turn up. And gorgeous colour. Very nice Series 1 Jaguar E-type. There's an Austin 7 Ulster rep alongside. There are quite a few Austin 7s there. Um, it's the, this year, well, there's a Ford Model T. But this year, 2022, is the 100th anniversary of the introduction of the Austin 7. Hence, there were quite a few Austin 7s at this particular meeting. They went for a bit of a road run before I got there. Um, and there were examples of Chummies all the way through to the Ruby. And this is a early Bullnose Morris Oxford. Very nice indeed. You can just see a Ruby parked alongside their maroon example of the mid to late 1930s, about 1936 or 37, I would have thought. Here's one of the little box saloons that turned up, OC906. I'm guessing that's sort of 1931, 32, something like that. But yeah, there were quite a few Austin 7s there, and it was great to see them out and about. Another one of the post war classics that turned up was this MGC Roadster on a G registration. Uh, great cars, these were a big, heavy six cylinder, three litre engine in the front of these. Very different to the MGB under the skin, even though it appears pretty similar from the outside. And here, 
they've got a Riley RM so there are various different versions of these over the years the early ones had running boards the later ones didn't some had the one and a half litre engine and others the two and a half litre this fantastic pre-war Alvis was one of the cars that turned up as well I don't think I've actually seen this car before so it was nice to have a pour over that one alongside it is a star yeah, there was a variety of cars that turned up at this particular meeting you know, the, of the E-types that arrived this one also lives locally you see it around from time to time This glorious Rover is a P3, a just post-war Rover P3, and it's the Sports Saloon, which has the lower roof line and only two windows per side, or four light bodywork, as they were called back in the day. Now, just a reflection of another of the Austin 7s, one of the sporty versions that turned up reflected in the Rover's hubcap. But yeah, going back to the Rover, it was a glorious car, restored throughout, inside and out, and it just looked absolutely wonderful. A great, great old car. As was this Austin Ruby, like I say, plenty of Austin 7s turn up. I think this was probably the latest one to turn up. Um, the others were chrome rad, I think they were all chrome rad cars, and painted rad on the early blue chummy, which you see here, FE9066. Lamps on the scuttle, as befits a fairly early example of the chummy. Like I say, these were first introduced in 1922, 100 years ago. And it's amazing that they're still so popular now. One of the later cars was this R Edge from the 1970s, a Ford Escort Mark II. Great little survivor. And this wonderful old Bentley turned up as well. Um, I'm not quite sure, I think it's a three litre example, very much a road going body, as opposed to another replica of the, uh, the racing uh, Bentleys, which you often tend to see. It was nice to see this very original car and also this wonderfully original Riley 9 Mullica. This was probably one of my favourite cars there, actually. So original, such a lovely little car. And many of these have been chopped up into specials, so to see this little saloon, it was a real treat to see that one. With the little Austin 7 Tora there. So this pub meet, which takes place throughout the summer, is usually very well attended. Um, those C806, the little two-tone Austin 7. And the Mighty Mustang couldn't be much more different. Um, occasionally you get an American car at this particular gathering. It's not a huge gathering by any means, but uh, you always get some interesting cars turn up. And just for an hour or two, is walking around in the field and having a chat. It's uh, all very pleasant. Nice old Vauxhall here, YYJ 924. Guessing that's early to mid, probably mid 1930s, judging by the look of it. Still on spoked wheels, the later ones were on easy clean wheels. This is a rapier, basically, a Lagonda. This is the rapier um, of the, I'm not quite sure of the age of this one, so I won't even try and guess. It's a very sporty car, the owner's had it for many, many years. And there's the little angler, just to prove that it did turn up. And there is another chummy alongside. All in all, a very great little meeting and a great way to spend an hour or two just wandering around and just generally enjoying the evening sun. So that's just a quick summary of this little meeting that we went to with the 1952 Anglia. Well, that was a pleasant little jolly. Like I said, I didn't bother doing a video while I was there, but I just posted up a few photos of some of the interesting cars that did turn up. A six volt glow there. None of this dazzling LED business here. It's nice to have the old girl out and about. It's not been out for a little while, but it's such a quiet engine, this. It's such a little sweetie. It may not be quick, but it's certainly quiet. I mean, That's one very happy sounding engine, all 8 horsepower, RAC rating, 933cc. There were a few spits and spots of rain in the air before, so I thought I'd head back. And I didn't want to be coming back in the dark, really. So, so that's okay. So let's just have a look, make sure the backlights are still working. 
Ooh, we appear to have a full complement of rear lights. Good heavens. Even a number plate. Oh, let's go and get the keys, open the garage up and put the angle away before it gets too dark.